Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I'm your host, Adam Porteris, and I'm joined by Sweet Sean Kovacs from the internet. Hey, what's the scoop? I'm Robin Hood. And of course, Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear, and I'm wearing my green tights for the occasion. That's not a surprise. I would not be shocked if Bruce owns not one pair of tights, but many pair of tights. Oh, yeah. The tighter, the better, too. <laughs> I let everybody know what's up. For real. I see my kids' stretchy pants and call them tights. <laughs> Perfect. And we are back this week with yet another review for you fine, fine listeners, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, once again, it is top of the month, and as such, we must say a hearty thank you to all the fine people that support us over at patreon.com slash HMP. These are the people who help keep this show going for, as of tomorrow, boys, six years. Yowza! That's right. We've been doing this show for six years, going into our seventh year. So, uh, man, time is flying fast. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, so with that, that's that's a pretty awesome thing, and it's awesome because of you guys, all you amazing people who help support this show. And we want to take a second to thank all the top dogs of this month. Coming in at the top spot is your boy. You know him, you love him, Tim the Long Hauler. Coming in at forty five dollars this month. Oh my goodness, Ooh, Tim, boy, Ooh. Long Hauler. But not 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 to be outdone here, nipping at his heels. We got. Uh, uh, at forty dollars coming in, Derek Copeland, aka Sir Slick Derek the Night Bard. <laughs> that yeah, that is a it. very that is a very Bruce Leslie nickname. <laughs> Did I come up with that one? It, I thought that was a Sean nickname. Get out of here. It Who feel- else would have come up with that? <laughs> Anything with bard in it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Sean and I have ever used the word bard in any sort of uh, <laughs> daily conversation. Yet Bruce, lots of that. <laughs> Uh, we also got Alex C. and Matthew S. coming in at the $20 level. Gentlemen, we could not be more thankful for that. And, of course, a big thank you to everyone who came in at the $5 a month level, by far our most popular level there. And a big thanks to everyone else who came in at all the different levels. Each dollar does make a difference, and we truly appreciate each and every one of you from the bottom of our hearts. And we do have a couple people to add to this illustrious bunch. Sean, get your H&P nicknames ready here. Oh, man, I am ready. Uh, this is going to take a bit. So but get ready. It's going to be good, though. I'm sure. Like, this is something new. We'll see. We're we'll excited. See. We're excited. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I have been uh, kind of uh, half assy when it comes to giving people nicknames. And, like, I have, like, this fake boilerplate thing where I sometimes would remember it and sometimes didn't. So, instead, what I am doing from this point forward is that if you contribute to Patreon, and here's the other, uh, we'll, we'll get to the other part next. If you contribute to Patreon and you're going to get a, you're going to get one a nickname and you're going to be introduced into the HMP universe by me by retrofitting the big speech from sports movies. All right. So coming in at the $5 level, first up, we've got Brian Kerr. Okay, Brian Kerr, here we go. Brian Kerr. Great moments are born from great opportunity. And that's what we have here tonight, Brian Kerr. And that's what you've earned here tonight, Brian Kerr. One nickname. And you may listen to 10 different podcasts. And nine of them might be better than ours, but not this show. Not tonight. Because tonight, you are one of us. Tonight, you have earned your HMP nickname. Tonight, we are the greatest podcast in the world because you were born to be an hmp -er. A ding a linger, and you were meant to be part of this podcast. This is your time, and your days of being alone are over. And I'm sick and tired of hearing about how great the Ringer Podcast Network is because tonight we have finally become united with Brian Kerr. This is your time. And Brian Kerr, it is my honor to announce that your new HMP nickname is Doris the Finkasaurus. <laughs> Doris the Finkasaurus. Perfect. All right. And uh, All right. You, you can't hear this, Sean, because it doesn't loop back your, your actual voice to you, but I'm throwing a little uh, a little reverb on you, and it is making these, this even more epic. So that's... Ooh. Uh, Ooh. When everyone so do you guys have any guess it. what that speech is from? Mighty Ducks. Close. No. Mighty Ducks 2. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> Not that close. <laughs> That's as close as you can get, I think. Slap shot. It is uh oh. it is miracle. Oh, oh I should have known that. The, the Herb Brooks Miracle on Ice speech. Oh, I could have gotten there eventually. Would have taken a while, but I could have gotten there. <laughs> I could have I could have started naming movies and eventually I would have got around to that one. <laughs> Is it a Star Wars? No. Uh, My no. next guess was going to be Slap Shots 2. Then I would have been looking for other hockey movies. <laughs> like, where are the other hockey voices <laughs> in? I don't know. All right. So next up, we got another we got another new subscriber, uh, Peter Carrera. Carrera? Correa? Peter Correa? I'd like to th- I like to think it's Korea the way that it's kind of spelled. It's spelled with a C, but man, I, I tell you, like that's a cool name. Peter Carrera. P- Peter Correa sounds like a like a secret agent. Peter Correa. But here we go. Hit it up. Peter Correa, there's a tradition in podcasting to not talk about the next step until you've climbed the one in front of you. I'm sure getting your HMP nickname is beyond your wildest dreams, so let's just keep it right there. Forget about the thousands of people who will now know your name, the size of what I like to call the HMP reach, and our fancy podcasting studio, and remember what got you here. You donated to Patreon, and you get a sweet-ass HMP nickname. And most important, Peter Correa, don't get caught up thinking about winning or losing this nickname. You put forth the effort and concentration in a striving towards your full potential, and now you are the best that you can be. And I don't care what other podcasts say at the end of the day. In my book, you are now one of us, and you are a winner. Okay? All right? Let's go. Let's go. Let me hear it. Let me hear it. Let's go. Peter Correa, from now on, your HMP nickname is Petey Bag of Balls. Congratulations, Petey Bag of Balls. You are now an HMP winner. Hell yeah. Was All right, that, that's two. That's two. Was that from Dodgeball, a true underdog story? No, it was not. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bruce any is guess, like, Adam? He went to Wikipedia and goes, sports movies. <laughs> I have no idea. Any, any guess, Adam? No, no. Uh, I'm Hoosiers. It is. It's Hoosiers. Oh, it's Hoosiers look at that. I took a stab. That was my second guess. <laughs> In true Bruce fashion, I was well, just Adam thinking won. that. Adam won. <laughs> and we got one more round in the base. Yeah, we got one more. We got one more. Uh, we, we've got another... Patreon subscriber, Neil Adamson. Coming in at the $5 level. Let's hear it. You're Neil Adamson. We're Team HMP gathered from all across America. And we're going to stick together. You know why? Because we are ding-a-lingers. And ding-a-lingers fly together. And just when you think that they're about to break apart, ding-a-lingers fly together. And then when the wind blows hard and the sky is black, ding-a-lingers fly together. And when the wind blows hard and the sky is black, which I just said, (laughs) ding-a-lingers fly together. And when the roosters are crowing and the cows are spinning circles in the pasture, ding-a-lingers fly together. And when everyone says it can't be done, ding-a-lingers fly together. Now new ding-a-lingers and old ding-a-lingers must unite to welcome someone new to our formation. And I thought perhaps something like this. Neil Adamson, your new HMP nickname is Chopsaki Chimichanga. <laughs> Congratulations, Chopsaki Chimichanga. You are now part of HMP. Now that was Mighty Ducks 2. No, that was the that first was Mighty Ducks. Absolutely Duck. Mighty Ducks 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was so Mighty good. Ducks 2. Because you have to bring a new person into the formation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love those kind of Bash Brothers stuff, man. Like turning that puck like uh, vertical and then slapping it. Boy, we were doing that playing street hockey like you wouldn't believe. Didn't make much sense, but we were doing it. <laughs> when I was a kid, we were too poor to afford a puck, and we just played with a day-old biscuit. <laughs> day-old. Uh, so yeah, man, if you too would like to get your name, uh, put into like a heroic sports speech and of course get yourself a fantastic nickname at the same time, uh, we, we, you know, thank you do that. So we do want to say a big thank you to all of you fine people who support this show really does help make a difference and we really appreciate that. But 
I hear you out there. You're going at him. And I'd like to congratulate Chopsaki Chimichanga oh. and Mikey Bag of Balls and Doris the Finkasaurus. Welcome to the fold. Indeed. But I, I know what you're saying, guys. Oh, but Adam, what, what do I get for helping the show? Well, that's easy. You get the show each week, obviously, but you also get the pre-show, post-show, and you get to vote on a movie that we watch every month. And, of course, you get the dinger zone. And let me tell you, right now, we are smack dab in the middle of our Mission Impossible franchise review. Each week, we're giving you a whole new show here. These shows are about an hour long apiece here, uh, where we review each Mission Impossible movie. This week, we're reviewing Mission Impossible 3 from director J.J. Abrams. So check that out now. Best part about it is during this quarantine lockdown, if you support us at any level, you'll get all the perks. So even at a dollar, you too can join all the fun over at patreon.com slash HMP. Try it out. See what we're doing over there. And if you can support us in any way, we'd be super grateful for that. So check us out, patreon.com slash HMP. And as we always say around here, everybody, it's value for value. Whatever you get from this show, <laughs> oh, just you. put that yes. in dollar form. Send it to us. It's that easy. If you love the show and it disappeared tomorrow, what would you pay to a month to make sure that that show stays on the air? But if you think that the show isn't worth supporting financially or funds are a little bit tight, fear not. We completely understand that. The main show is always going to be free to download. All we ask is that you review us on iTunes, subscribe to us on YouTube. We just hit 1,000 subscribers over on YouTube, which was pretty awesome. Uh, and just tell a friend. That's all you can do. At the end of the day, the best thing that you can do is telling a friend for this show. Easiest way to make sure that the show grows. And we keep reviewing superhero and comic book films for years to come. That's patreon.com slash HMP. Support us today. And thank you all for supporting the greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. That said, boys, we got a little bit more business before we get to our review here. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's a, we got a jam-packed show today. I'm not even going to lie huge. to you. It's huge. It's huge. Uh, we haven't done it in a bit, boys, but we got two of them today. Let's open up the old H&P mailbag. Bales here. This one comes to us from Nelson. Nelson writes, Hey guys, I loved your review of Initial D. I'm a fan of the manga and love the animated series. The movie was good, but suffered from straying from the comic. Bunta was not an absolute drunk. The manga never really talks about his wife, and I feel the movie tried to address it by deciding that she was dead and he spiraled out of control. No clue. Also, Itsuki was not the son of the gas station owner. They just all work there. All in all, it wasn't the worst adaptation, and I hope they continue as the story gets more interesting and the pace definitely picks up. Anyway, keep up the good work. That was from Nelson. Thanks for the email there, buddy. Nice. nice. Uh, that's not all, though. Uh, next email comes to us from Jim, and this one's entitled, Sean Kovacs, Asian People Love You. <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I want this I want this email framed. You need to send me this email immediately. It's going up in my office. No kidding. <laughs> hey guys, just uh got the chance to send an email. I really want to reassure you that not all Asians hate Sean. <laughs> <laughs> We love you from Manila, Philippines. Thanks for the show and constantly churning out content. These podcasts help me and my friends through this quarantine. Cheers, that quiet Filipino gentleman, Jim. Hey, Jim. Jim. <laughs> my wife was born in the Philippines. Thanks for listening. Jim, somebody's getting a high five from me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that does it for uh, the emails here. Let's close up the old mailbag. Bales here. And as always, you, if you'd like to send us an email, you can do that at heromoviepodcast at gmail.com. Well, let's get into it, boys. There were some, shall we say, interesting things going over at patreon.com slash HMP last week. Out of nowhere, The Adventures of Robin Hood soared up to number one. And if you add more accounts, by the way, to uh, get your movie up to number one uh, during the voting and stuff, we ain't going to be mad at you. You know, you do what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> but we're like politicians. We can be bought easily. Oh, yeah. We're, you know, Matt and I said it a long time ago on uh, on the film fine. We were just like, we can be bought. We will we will favorably review your film if you start parking money in our pockets. So, uh, you know, we can be bought for sure. Uh, so, <laughs> so we decided to make good this week because it, it went to the top there, but it was at a later time. Uh, but I do want to, I'll certainly make a note next time when the voting ends so we don't have these problems or anything like that. But let's go ahead and listen to the trailer for The Adventures of Robin Hood. England, in the gallant days when history hung on the flight of an arrow or the slash of a sword, when feudal barons ravaged the countryside to live in pomp and splendor. 
when one man alone dared challenge the might of his country's oppressors, Robin Hood, outlaw of Sherwood Forest and his stalwart band, robbing the rich to feed the poor, ready to fight for king, for country, or for maiden fair. Now, this forest is wide. It can shelter and clothe and feed a band of good determined men, good swordsmen, good archers, good fighters. Are you with me? It's Errol Flynn as Robin Hood, Olivia de Havilland as Maid Marian, Claude Rains, Basil Rathbone, and a cast of thousands, reliving history's most colorful adventure. I suppose you realize the penalty for killing a king's deer is death. Are there no exceptions? Will you come with me? To Sherwood. I have nothing to offer you but a life of hardship and danger, but we'd be together. But I love you, Robin, I'd come. Even the danger would mean nothing if you were with me. Let me ram those words down his throat, Your Highness. From this night on, I use every means in my power to fight you. All righty, that was the trailer for The Adventures of Robin Hood from 1938, starring Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland, Basil Rathbone, awesome name, Basil Rathbone, Claude Rains, and a cast of thousands, directed by Michael Curtiz. But before we get to our review here, you know what time it is, boys and girls. Bruce, what do you got for us this week? Well, Robin Hood is one of the original templates from which so many comic book heroes have been molded. He's the original outlaw fighting for what's right, standing up to the power that rules on behalf of the oppressed, and of course, stealing from the rich to give to the poor. In the abstract sense, he's clearly the inspiration for Zorro, who was, in turn, the inspiration for Batman. Also, what is the Punisher, if not a modern-day take on Robin Hood? Both had everything that is important taken from them. Both oppose uh, the corrupt with lethal force, and both live larger as a legend than in real life. As far as philosophical inspirations go, even the balladeer from the Dukes of Hazard referred to Bo and Luke as two modern-day Robin Hoods. Then, of course, there are the more concrete characters based on Robin Hood, like Batman's sidekick Robin, who, despite his bird theme, derived his name and original green felt shoes from the legendary protector of Sherwood Forest. There's also Green Arrow, who is about as much of a faithful Robin Hood reproduction as one can ask for, right down to his red-clad sidekick, Speedy, who is, of course, analogous to Will Scarlet. There's also Hawkeye, who may take his name from James Fenimore Cooper, but has far more in common with Robin Hood than he does with Natty Bumpo. Uh, let's not forget that Robin Hood himself has appeared in many a comic because Robin Hood is a public domain character, and there are few things comic publishers love as much as free IP. <laughs> now, the first continuing Robin Hood stories were written and drawn by a guy named Sven Elvin and appeared in the DC Comics title New Adventure Comics in 1938. Uh, there was also a Robin Hood backup story in Green Hornet number seven, with the Hornet being another character who has more than a passing resemblance to the old time archer. Uh, Robin Hood continued to grace comics in the 50s, such as Charlton Comics, who retitled Danger and Adventure to Robin Hood and his Merry Men, starting with issue 28. Quality Comics published Tales of Robin Hood until issue number seven, then was bought by DC Comics, who continued until issue 13 and included a crossover with Wonder Woman, making it the longest lasting English language Robin Hood series. DC also published Robin Hood stories in their Brave and the Bold anthology series from number five to number 15. In the 1960s, Dell published a couple of Robin Hood one shots. In 1974, Gold Key Comics produced a seven-issue tie-in with the Disney animated Robin Hood. Eclipse published a three-part miniseries in 1991, and really, the list goes on and on. One question that continues to burn in the hearts and minds of Robin Hood fans persists. Was Robin Hood real? Well, Robert was a very common given name in medieval England, and Robin was its very common diminutive. The surname Hood was also fairly common because it referred either to a hooder who was a maker of hoods or alternatively to someone who wore a hood as a head covering just by a matter of mathematical probability. There were a few people called Robin hood, but were any of them the Robin hood 
from 1261 onward, the name Robin Hood occurs in the roles of several English justices as nicknames or descriptions of criminals, because any robber who wore a hood and refused to give his true name could just be called Robin Hood. Kind of like today, how you might call someone shoplifter t-shirt or dine and dash pullover. <laughs> well, the earliest known legal records mentioning a person called Robin Hood are from 1226, found in York, when that person's goods were 32 shillings and six pence, were confiscated and he became an outlaw. Historian Oscar DeVille discusses the career of John Dayville and his brother Robert during the Second Barons War. John, along with his relatives, led the remaining rebel faction on the Isle of Eli. John was eventually pardoned, but Robert remained an outlaw, possibly forming the inspiration for Robin Hood. David Baldwin identifies Robin Hood with the historical outlaw Roger Godbird, which uh, would place Robin Hood around the 1260s. And a couple of other theories include Robert Hood, who is documented as having lived in the city of Wakefield at the start of the 14th century, and Robin Hood, who is recorded as being employed by Edward II of England during 1323. Of course, the overarching problem is that Robin Hood was a stock alias used by thieves. So no matter how many real examples of Robin Hood there may be, none of them can live up to the legend. And at the end of the day, it is the legend, not the man we truly love. Yeah, now I I, I had mentioned last week, and we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to, like we have one more email just before we get to our Robin rating. Uh, but just I just wanted to say that so I could remind you guys to remind me. But um, I, I grew up not knowing a lot about Robin Hood. I, I had actually, up until this point, had actually never seen uh, this movie. And I, my biggest Robin Hood touchstone is the Disney animated film. Oh, really? The Fox? Yeah. I, yeah. I When I was growing up, that was on heavy rotation. So much so. And, and I always kind of thought, like, growing up, if you're a boy, Robin Hood is your favorite Disney movie. Like, it's the one for boys. You know, it's yeah. not like Snow White or Bambi or whatever. Um, I absolutely love that animated Robin Hood, too, though I didn't get to see it as much as uh, you might have, Adam. Yeah, it was wasn't like, quite we, in heavy rotation when I was younger. We had VHS, and, like, it was it was played all the time. Like, the music is great. The animation is awesome. And, like, it, it's so great to see how much this movie actually, you know, shadows that movie or vice versa, really. But very cool. Have you guys had experience based on the same set of core stories that have been told uh, orally for hundreds of years? I couldn't imagine Sean being a big Robin Hood guy. Uh, Growing up, you're right. I I wasn't Um, my my big intro to to the mythos besides, you know, the children's stories and stuff like that is uh, uh, is the Kevin Costner Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. That was big, Uh, which which is not great. That is not a great movie. But uh, I, it's not like I hated it or something. I it, I was just indifferent, you know. Like I, I'm not the type of person where if if I don't like something, I hate it. Like I'm not that person. But uh, I I just complete and utter indifference. Um, and uh, to be honest, you bringing up Green Arrow earlier, Bruce, I always thought that you know th- those two characters are are intertwined. You know, I, I yeah. think it, it's it's DC's version of Robin hood really. And that's fine. But because of it, I was never a huge fan. You know, uh, when you've got a guy standing next to green arrow who has a ring, who literally anything can come out of that ring dude yeah. with arrows is, is second place. I got a boxing glove on the end of this arrow. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's your go-to for, for green arrow. If you don't like the boxing glove, you're not going to like green arrow. Yeah. That's right. Pretty much. <laughs> and so, uh, quite honestly, uh, this really, this, property this ip i guess didn't really stand a chance for me you know i was a star wars kid i was a gi joe kid like that's what i was into so i i and 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 full disclosure i never saw the the robin hood disney movie with the fox i've I've never seen that movie and so i i knew you know i know the, the the mains and i and i get the gist behind the story and it's a cool story i mean quite honestly it is a cool story but I'm not someone who uh, seeks it out. And so when this came about uh, to, to watch this movie, uh, I'll use the descriptor prickly when it came to seeing this movie. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, 
and and so I I you know this week I I you know I was like him and Han with you guys off air about how like eh, no one's gonna l- listen to the show this week because of the blah 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 blah, and so I went into it you know kind of like kind of like oh well like I'll see this movie and and like a lot of old older films. I have I have a problem with a lot of them, um, you know, like some s- certain ones sneak through. Like I love Treasure of the Sierra Madre. I think that's a great movie. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, all all old movies sound like this and everybody <laughs> talks like this and real fast. And it's it's Kurt and everyone's a stage actor. So everyone talks like this and everyone's screaming. But the what uh, you know i got like maybe like 20 minutes 25 30 minutes into the movie and i couldn't help but be charmed you know it, it like this is a very charming movie and i understand why people love this era i uh, now i understand it just through this watching this movie you know it's not no one would ever believe that errol flynn lived in medieval england that is not the point of this movie. No. The point of the movie is to make something that is charming and fun and uh, a bit of a spectacle and uh, the golden era of movies, uh, their version of what an action movie would be. Yeah. You got to understand this is 1938. So this is one year before Hollywood takes off gigantically with kind of, you know, what is arguably the best year for Hollywood cinema ever in 1939 that had like your uh, your Gone with the Winds and Wizard of Oz and things like that. Well, Olivia de Havilland's in Gone with the Winds. Indeed she is. Uh, and and this is a, a full color movie before Wizard of Oz, too, you know, and I think that this movie uh, makes brilliant use of color with color being a new thing. You know, this is like the 3D movie where every single thing comes at your face. Well, this is the color movie where every yeah. color is just beautiful and bright. Well, and see, one of yeah. the things about that is is that this is Technicolor, which was a much superior color format then. And as you saw in this film, man, those Technicolor po- colors pop so big. And, you know, you'd see that the next year in Gone with the Wind of just these very bold and bright colors and stuff. And they... And they, like, you know, kind of tailor-made all of the costumes and everything towards that. And I'll say this. I am surprised at how amazingly good this movie still looks. They have have restored this thing and made it look just top-notch good. Yeah, there's none of that Technicolor bleed that you get from a lot of older movies. And everything is just real sharp and stuff. So, like, you won't watch this and go, like, oh, it looks like a grainy old just nothing. And it's it's hard to watch. Very easy on the eyes. And it's so bright and compelling (laughs) that, you know, you're going to look at it. And I think this is one of the best blending. And, you know, I'm not a... Uh, an authority by any means there's tons of old adventure movies that maybe i haven't seen but like this is one of the best blending of the stage experience with the movie experience like that you know you say they're all stage actors these sets none of them have ceilings you know these are all stage type sets um it's filmed very much like a stage play but it's it's done in a way that works really well on camera for me and it, it, you can see why it would appeal to me when I was like eight, nine years old. You know, this is something that kids are going to just be pulled into. Yeah. And, and, you- I, and I know this is a I know this is a stupid comparison. I, I, I do understand that. But it's the way I was thinking about it as I was watching this movie is that, you know, when the Brady Bunch is in their backyard, you don't believe for a second that that is actually yeah. a, a real backyard. And so for let's say 95 percent of this movie is on is on stages and it's on sets and it's again it's part of the charm of the movie you know that when they are actually outside the movie looks very very different than when they're on stages and And do you know what the stand-in was for sherwood forest at california i'm gonna guess (laughs) next to the next to the back lot (laughs) chico they were in chico california for the uh, outdoor stuff there are no trees in Chico today, so that shows you how much times have changed. Yeah. That's not true, but <laughs> I like to think this that it's also is. $2 million. This was the most expensive film Warner Brothers had ever made at the time in 1938. Well, there's so many damn people in this movie. I, I understand. I, I get why it's so expensive is that every single time that camera backs out, there's 50 people <laughs> in each set. And Bruce and mentions each, the each sets. The costumes, you know, like like not not off the rack kind of costumes here. you got to make these things. 
Um, Bruce, you're talking about oh, there's no ceilings for the sets and stuff. But the, these sets go up like 20, 30 feet in the air. They're just yeah. unbelievably huge. And like you, you look at it and you know where every bit of that money went because it is all on screen. Yeah. And uh, just some more like uh, interesting behind the scenes. This was about two years, three years in, in getting made. Uh, originally, James Cagney was going to be Robin Hood for this Ooh, movie. What a, what, I like James Cagney a whole bunch, but boy, is he wrong for Robin Hood. Did he <laughs> tell him to go screw? He wasn't wearing the tights? <laughs> I, I don't know, but Warner Brothers had made all their money from like gangster movies at this point, lower budget gangster movies. So they were just going to go with their bankable star, James Cagney. And somewhere along the way, it didn't work out. So Errol Flynn came in and we didn't get to hear Robin Hood call people a dirty rat. <laughs> <laughs> That'd have been fun, though. So now, Errol Flynn, mm-hmm. let's get to Errol Flynn. Yes, let's talk about Errol Flynn because I have like an image of Errol Flynn in my mind that is different than what Errol Flynn really is. Okay, what's, so what's, what's the in image your in your mind? The image in my mind is probably closer to a Clark Gable type. Uh, I uh-huh. think a lot of times I even think of Douglas Fairbanks when I'm actually thinking of Errol Flynn. Mm, um, uh, you know, a little bit of conflagration goes on there. But I remember Errol Flynn as being more picture perfect than he is. Like, I like I like that he's a little uh, a little bit flawed and not the uh, not the Rudolph Valentino type that I always had pictured in my head. Yeah, he's not squ- he's not, you know, like a square with a square jaw and a perfect hair. Like, he's just not that guy. But there is something about him where you're like, that is a good looking man. Yeah, yeah, but it, it it's like good looking, uh, almost by a modern standard. Like he, like I said, he's closer. Uh, you yeah. know, there's some differences, but he's kind of closer to a Charlie Hunnam type than he is to a Clark Gable type. And I sure. absolutely did not remember it that way. But unlike yeah, Charlie Hunnam, he actually has a personality, and and, and there's reason to like him. I want to like Charlie <laughs> Hunnam, but Charlie there's Hunnam's got great personality, man. Go watch the gentleman again. Uh, I, they're I, also they're also both Australian, so that. That comes together nicely. Oh. It, proven. Prove my point. <laughs> uh, so, so I I, uh, I knew nothing about Errol Flynn at all. Um, and so after I watched this movie, I wanted to know a little bit, bit more about him. Do you guys know anything about Errol Flynn off screen? I do not. Not not a ton. No. Oh boy, get ready for a roller coaster. Here we go. So Errol Flynn is basically uh, Robert Downey Jr when he was going through it only times 10 and uh the law got involved for way more than just uh listen you have a drug problem (laughs) so so errol flynn errol flynn uh uh, dies at 50 after his fourth heart attack his fourth heart attack at 50 killed him you are living it up if you're if you're 50 and you're on your fourth heart attack you're having a time well, the the piles of cocaine that Errol Flynn used to ingest probably has a lot to do with that. <laughs> and he had been kicked out of, most famously, he got kicked out of a Warner Brothers party because he got completely and utterly hammered. And keep in mind, this is at the time of, like, studio fixers. So... When Errol Flynn is getting into it and, you know, like, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know the right way to put this because it's awful what he's doing, but taking liberties with ladies, I guess, is the right way to put it. That's good. Okay. Uh, he, uh, there's only so much a fixer can fix. And so when he gets arrested numerous times for doing this, it starts getting out in the public that this is what's happening. Like, and... <laughs> So if it's getting out to the public at a time when fixers are like, hey, here's some money, uh, L.A. Times, like, don't please don't publish this thing. You can only imagine how much behind the scenes stuff was happening when when he's when he's doing all this stuff. Those are the things they reported. What what did they hush up? That's what I mean. And so you also on top of that. So on top of all of these things. On top of uh, of of the, the the massive amounts of drug abuse, uh, the, of being a fall down drunk, all of these things, he gets he gets married and divorced four times. And on top of that, he is arrested for sex with a minor, and that is what gets him arrested in the first place. This is one of my favorite stories of all time in Hollywood ever. 
So he he goes he goes to court. And although the saying was around a bit already, it was made massively famous in like Flynn because of Errol Flynn. Oh, that man. is when it really just explodes. And like everyone's like, you know what? That It's Errol Flynn. Let's talk about Errol Flynn in like Flynn. Right. So he gets he gets arrested. He goes to court for uh, statutory rape of a minor. He gets off. He gets off on the charges. He then starts dating the woman who ran the snack bar at the courtroom where he had just been arrested <laughs> and tried for statutory rape. Oh, you were there, lady, but did you just see what went on? To not learn your lesson. <laughs> to immediately start hitting on the lady at the snack bar as you are going to court every day for statutory rape. You have literally learned nothing. I like the idea that there's courts out there that have snack bars. It, yeah, and that yeah. is that is who Errol Flynn is. Not so hot. <laughs> amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Stay classy, Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Man. Oddly enough, the more things change, the more things stay the same in many cases. <laughs> well, you can't get away with what you used to be able to get away with. Like just, that's what too bad he wasn't that's what I took away. You know, just because Elvis and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, as long as you marry the twelve year old, it's fine. <laughs> There's certain things that you just gotta be okay with. Uh, but he's, well, he's and I looked it up. I looked it up because you know he liked to throw it around. I wanted to see if he actually had a relationship with Olivia De Havilland because they're in multiple movies. This isn't the only movie yeah. they did. I together. think they made nine together. Say what? I think it was nine. I think that was the tally of movies they made together. Oh wow! I didn't know it was nine. Wow! But it turns out, uh, according to Olivia De Havilland herself, who is still alive, by the way, insane. Uh, I know. I know it. She's got to be a hundred. She uh, she said she said that uh, she was very attracted to the man, but she never actually had a relationship with him. And uh, I would imagine it's because of the off screen antics. He's one of those people. I think you could say he was married four times and never had a relationship. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you know what I mean. Ba- Basil I Rathbone had the exact same kind of opinion about him, which is just like, yeah, we work together, we get along well enough. I wouldn't go so far as to say we're friends. And like, that's when you know somebody is just probably he's probably kind of a crap guy. Where it's just like he's a good worker, we work well together. I wouldn't go so far as to say we're friends, but you know, it's all right. And, and Basil <laughs> Rathbone, probably far and away my favorite actor in this movie, but it's not because of this movie. You know, it's because I love Sherlock Holmes and. Sherlock uh-huh. Holmes and Basil Rathbone are intertwined forever. Um, yeah. Is this Errol Flynn's big movie? Yes. Yeah, the, that's kind of what big I'm one. thinking. That's always the idea I had, but I didn't know if he had some other swashbuckler movies out there that I'm overlooking. Like everybody loves his Francis Drake movie or something. Captain Blood was the yeah, big and, one. You know, before he's in this. like Captain Blood and yeah. things like that. But for the most part, I mean, his biggest his biggest movie is this one. Well, the guy, the actor that really uh, interested or intrigued me here was Alan Hell Sr. Mm-hmm. Because I think he's, you know, the cast just lists him as Alan Hell at the time. So for a brief moment, I thought the skipper was that old. <laughs> but, yeah, I looked it up. This is the skipper's dad. And, and, you know, sometimes actors enjoy being typecast. Sometimes actors uh, resist that idea that they're being typecast. Well, all I'm going to say is Alan Hell, who played Little John in this movie, had played Little John before in a movie, and he played Little John after in a movie. So typecast, not just typecast, but like, you're going to make a Robin Hood movie, I'm your Little John. And you can make a career out of being Little John. And I got to say, man, you know, my my sister just had a baby, and that baby looks, it, it is the same person. Like, I mean, they're... they're the, it's Alan like Hill? there's no father. It's just a clone of her. Oh, I and that is Alan how I Hale. feel looking at Al- Alan Hale and Alan Hale Jr. <laughs> this baby it's, looks it's, just like Alan same Hale. Person. <laughs> I kind of wonder if he was running some kind of scam in Hollywood where they're like, you're too old for this role. And then he put Junior after his name and claimed to be his own son. <laughs> it just got a lot of work done, but really good Cause, work. Because Skipper did not look young. Like if you told me Skipper was 96 years old when they filmed Gilligan's Island, I'd kind of go with it. He probably wasn't actually a lot younger than he than he certainly looked back then. He, 24 in season one, I read. No. <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> Bob Denver, 14 when Gilligan's Island started. 
<laughs> but, but uh so I, what you've told me about the behind the scenes on Errol Flynn explains what I was going to ask is my next question is this movie was so successful that they immediately went to work on a sequel that never got made. And I think Errol Flynn might be the reason of that uh, with all those stories you told me. Yeah. It, it well, was my guess nuts. is that when like, you know, they, they just kept running into it where like, look, we can't make another $2 million movie, you know? And especially with, when your when your lead actor is this troubled, I mean, there there's no getting around it. This man is a mess, and you know, are you going to put are are you going to double down and put two million more dollars on a sequel to something where the guy might not even show up? You he know, I, I, I can't imagine him doing that. And filming or something. And uh, say what I said, he might have his third of five heart attacks while you're filming. <laughs> right, uh, exactly. But I think the movie made like triple its budget back. It was a huge success for Warner Brothers. I think it was part of what mm -hmm. took them to a higher level, you know, in 1930s. Yeah, and again, like um, I said, that was when everything was really starting to build. And I think this really helped to usher in that big golden age of Hollywood because like the next year would be the most financially successful. But I certainly think uh, this movie helped that ramp up because people just kept going back and it was this big large technicolor marvel and everybody's just like oh my gosh we got to go see that again now i think the money that was most well spent on this whole movie out of the whole budget i read that extras were paid 150 dollars a piece to put like this bunch of balsa wood over a metal plate under their shirt and get shot in the chest with an arrow like all those people that are shot with arrows in this movie, those are real arrows being shot into balsa wood stuffed under their uh, tunics there. It's so Oh, I, I was wondering how they did that because that isn't an actual arrow hitting them. Yeah, there's no, yeah, it's yeah. not there's, like there's the. no Hollywood on that. <laughs> That's yeah. circus level. So many cuts that you see in Hollywood movies and stuff is like they'll just cut to a guy and he'll be reacting having already had the arrow in his chest. You see it right. fly through the air and straight up hit multiple people straight in the chest and like the sound on it is fantastic and you you're like oh my lord they just they just shot that man and and the art it was surprising to me because you know being a being a, a clint eastwood westerns fan i can't tell you how many times i've seen a guy just clutch his chest and fall to the ground okay. you know and and you know 150 bucks was a lot of money in 1938 but you still yeah. got to be thinking the, the chance of that arrow hitting me in the face isn't zero <laughs> you know like like you you probably don't live through that shot if it's a few inches to the north of where that pad is yeah but at the same time too they weren't letting they weren't letting errol flynn actually shoot them they had like a real you know proper well, the, bow masters the guy, and stuff the, the guy the archery expert is a guy named howard hill who from all the descriptions i read about him were just around this movie but the guy sounds like an archery legend he mm -hmm. really split the arrow they had him split the arrow for that scene, you know, when he's at the archery wow. contest. And, of wow. course, Bill Flynn is not who's shooting that. But Howard Hill, the uh, stunt coordinator slash archery expert, like how many guys are good at those two things? I don't know. Maybe a <laughs> lot. But uh, he, he's the one who took all the, sh the trick shots with the arrows. He actually split an arrow for this movie. Again, I love all, like, with the arrow shooting championship and everything. It's so cool. It's like, again, having really just – grown up on the Disney bit watching that was just like watching it in live action. And it was just so cool. I was like, Oh, this is so great. I finally get to see the thing that my silly little cartoon was based on. And they took so many cues from it. It was just, it, it was so, so great to see that in actual live action. And, and I will say that like the, the costume, the disguise that Robin hood wears to the archery contest, Man, I know this is a year before The Wizard of Oz comes out, but boy, if he didn't look like the scarecrow to me. <laughs> like, all yeah. he needed was a little straw coming out from under that quaff he had over his head. It looked good, though. I, I like that as, as the costume for it and everything. The only thing I didn't like was uh, that, I mean, I'd like, it's fine, but one of the things in the cartoon that they actually do to, you know, prove that it's Robin Hood is he puts his sword through the back of his costume and then rips it out, and then the costume itself falls out and his regular Robin Hood clothes are underneath. I always thought that was pretty cool. Didn't have that, but, of course, animation is a lot easier to do that than it is in live action. Yeah, you would have loved it if uh, Errol Flynn showed up dressed as a crane or a flamingo or whatever that costume is that Robin <laughs> I was good. Stuff. I wonder. I wonder whose idea it was to put the sparkles in his sleeves, because they're they're like sparkly glitter on on his sleeves. You gotta oh, let I, people know I, you're I coming. That. 
<laughs> Say what? I, I didn't appreciate that. I didn't notice that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one of those things where I was like, man, they, they just didn't care at all. <laughs> they just want to have something that looks flashy. Now, um, I, I think most people's takeaway, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just because uh, I was affected in a very specific way when I watched this movie. But the the big fight in the castle at the end, I mean, I, I think that that sword fight between uh, uh, between Robin Hood and Guy is like the, the, the sword fight by which all cinematic sword fights are measured. Like, it's a benchmark for on-screen sword fights. Um, and I, I absolutely love the end of this movie. Do you guys like that, or is it kind of boring to you? No, it's fantastic. That fight, you're going down the stairs, is really awesome. When they go over and the, the shadows are on that big pillar and everything, it is so cool. And you're looking at just going like, we have like been cribbing from this forever. Yeah, that that camera shot where they they're doing like the shadow boxing with swords there. That is one of the most memorable shots of the whole movie for me. And just yeah, I liked it. I mean, you know, it's uh man, it, it feels like a stage play to me, but you know, it's they're very good at it, both both men. And uh the the shots linger. I mean, they really had to have their sword fight choreography down and of course they're not doing some of the more exciting things that might be done with sword fights later on, but it's still just really cool to me. And the fact that Errol Flynn bends his sword and and you know, you can tell the sword is bent but he's still going on. I love it. And like he did a lot of those just big giant jumps that you see. Like th- this guy's jumping down from like you know eight feet off of places. It's kind of astounding. I mean, then some yeah, of them are faked, but some of them are certainly real. And you're like, wow, he just no, kind of no, no stunt doubles in this sword fight. I mean, that they had to choreograph and and carry out that sword fight with long shots too. So they're they're getting a lot yeah. of it, you know, going on continuously without having to stop and take breaks. See all the faces and everything for sure. Uh, and, and speaking of other fights and stuff, I like the Friar Tuck stuff is great. Uh, the Little John stuff is great. Like all of those like little action set pieces, they're all so much fun. And, and they're there to to just include snippets of famous Robin Hood stories. Personally, I felt like it was nice that they included the key merry men, but I do feel like they really didn't give Little John or Friar Tuck or even much the Miller, uh, a whole lot to do, or even Will Scarlet. I mean, they're all here, and it's nice, and it's it's good that they're included, but they really didn't give those characters a whole lot to do. But I, I do like the idea that uh, that they're they're going to the the friar there to just be like, look, we're doing a lot of bad stuff. Uh, you want to just absolve us of all of our sins and stuff? That's why we'll have you on, and you're an awesome swordsman too. So that's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, and you know when. Uh, we're kids and the, the kids in the neighborhood or the cousins are over and you're playing Robin Hood. One thing that's nice about the Merry Men is there's enough of them that everybody gets to play. It's not like Star Wars where, you, where somebody gets to be Luke, somebody gets to get to be Han, and the rest have to be stormtroopers. But I was <laughs> always the Friar Tuck of the bunch. There, That's no surprise <laughs> there. And I think you all, you probably like, you know, volunteered for that bit though, yes? Oh man, I love that guy. There He's you like, go. <laughs> Sort of the comedic relief, but he's actually a better sword fighter than Robin is. Uh yeah, it's it was I, I love that. I love that whole uh that whole spiel that yeah, they that's were doing. A great bet. And and I love that this is at least the first time that I can remember seeing a lot of this where the kind of band of merry men, there's so many of them. It's I I really enjoyed that. I was like, oh, I never really thought about them going like, oh, we've got like a hundred dudes behind us and stuff. Yeah, he had his old his whole army in Sherwood Forest. I mean, they weren't all uh, named characters, but he always had a good size uh, gang behind him. Yeah, uh, I, I liked how when Olivia De Havilland comes in and like uh, she's he's walking her through the entire area of like, hey, here's where all the people that were actually helping. To me, this uh, even though it's not about it, this is one of the most like kind of America movies ever to me because these are the guys that are just going, hey, we don't like these people who are taking way too much tax money from us. We're going to, you know, they didn't mind paying taxes, but they didn't want to be overtaxed to where, you know, they were poor and couldn't eat and everything. So they took back that and gave it to these people. And that's something we don't see in a lot of the Robin Hood stuff is really the empathetic people that Robin Hood and his band of Merry Men are actually helping out. And I thought that was a really great addition to this to give – uh, what they were doing a little bit of substance. Yeah, these they're, they're the whole reason for the character. Yeah, I think they they address that well. Yep. Uh, um, go ahead. 
What did you think about the score here, Adam? This is one of the first movies that ever used a symphonic score. Uh, the score was the score was good. I think the biggest thing that like really that I think I paid far more attention to than anything else was the sound design because sometimes like when like the arrow sounds fantastic sword sounds I'm like ooh that is on set sound and that is not fantastic yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I wish they would have, I think that's where I kind of lied more than anything on that. And part of me also, again, this is just me being an audio nerd here, but I'm like, oh, I wish they had done a little bit better job remastering the sound. So like the, the actual score and everything could feel a little bit more full because what we're working with here is obviously just a regular mono, uh, signal and everything. But so it kind of comes out tinny and a little bit washed out and stuff. I wish they could go back and really, you know, judge that up as it were, but, uh, overall it was ADR. Good. I mean, not even really that. I mean, that's not, honestly, that's not one of the big problems, but it's just, just a lot of the sound is a little bit tinny and stuff. I mean, the music itself is fine, but like the fidelity is not where I would like it to be. But I'm again, I'm picky. Well, the composer was a guy named Korngold, and uh, he was Austrian, and he did a lot of music for operas. And they wanted this to have kind of an operatic feel. You know, we've already talked about the stage feel. He wasn't convinced he wanted to do uh, music for movies, but he came and took a meeting in uh, Los Angeles. While he's there, the Nazis invade Austria. And he's like, okay, looks like I'm not going home. So why not? I got to make a living somehow. So he does this. He wins an Oscar for uh, his score in this movie. And later, uh, John Williams has said that it's Korngold's work on this movie that inspired his uh, score for Star Wars. So, I mean, it's had some major uh, ripples. I mean, he kind of introduced the symphonic score into motion pictures, which I think is a cool thing to, to say about a guy. Yeah, there's there's a lot of really great cues here that you could definitely go like, oh, I I'd certainly see John Williams' uh, uh, influence w- when he was like, oh, okay, I think I can pull some stuff from that and that kind of stuff. And and this is Michael Curtis, by the way, that we didn't talk about, which uh, uh, he's also a, a gentleman who's probably not the best of people. If you look up uh, some of the bit of history of him, bit of a jerk. He uh, clearly didn't care about the horses in this film, from what everybody <laughs> is saying. Uh, but he was a big time jerk. But he would later go on to uh, direct Casablanca, would probably be the big thing that everybody recognizes him from. Uh, but a lot of other things as well but you don't hear his name a lot because uh history says that he was uh, not a nice guy huh people yeah they, uh, the 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 treatment of animals right up until about like like maybe 15 minutes ago uh not not the best not the best roadmap for 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 uh animal safety in movies yeah. uh, and, and all you need to see is the deer in this movie where that is an actual deer that they got draped over their shoulders now i'll say this in a in a production where they actually shoot arrows at the chests of extras i don't expect they're treating animals great <laughs> no but yeah and, and i mean that is the you know and you're and you're right man i mean you know the expectation of people treating animals poorly in, in movies is you know I mean, that's just going to I'll say this. Until- I, uh, may, I don't know why it makes me feel at least a little bit better, but at least that one that he tossed on the table there was clearly stuffed. It did not have the weight of <laughs> of, 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 a, of one that still got all of its innards in it. So I, I gave him credit for that, of at least cleaning it up to the point where it wasn't going to be ridiculously gross and, you know, smell up the whole uh, uh, studio there. Now, this movie wasn't the number one box office winner in 1938 as a whole. But I thought it was real interesting that there were a few states. I guess they broke it down by state in 1938. But uh, Robin Hood was the number one box office draw in 1938 in the states of Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas. So it had some kind of real rural appeal to it. Well, and that's the thing, too, is that we, we're also at a time in, in cinema, and this actually went on much longer than that in, in different forms, of – movies kind of coming out in spits and spurts all over the place. Sometimes they would just show for a little while here and then they'd move over here for a little bit and then over to the next place. And a lot of times those exact same prints would be the ones going as well. So, you know, if you were, you know, in in Des Moines, maybe your, you know, copy looks a lot worse than it would in, say, you know, New Jersey. Yeah. 
and and that's a practice that went on for a while too i mean that wasn't like something that was still going on as long as movies were on film there were still places that didn't get first run oh yeah i mean all the way up i mean really there's still a couple cases of it happening around in the 90s and stuff and that was one of the the reasons that george lucas helped uh, push a lot of the digital stuff because he was he was mad that like a lot of these prints that kept getting played and played and played looked like garbage but with digital at least you know the first time the last time it's always going to look the same every time which is a good thing there's there's and that's a whole nother conversation for another day about uh, 35 versus uh video and everything but it certainly helped over the long haul yeah as a kid who saw et in about year two in hazard kentucky that film was pretty worn out oh and that was a, <laughs> and i'll be honest with you that movie was that was one of the that movie has the ranking for the top number one spot of all time just of, of consecutive number one weeks in a row uh for for et there was like i think like six months or something where it was like number one you couldn't stop that thing so i'm sure by the time that you got that one it had been well played out <laughs> and, because uh, it's a wonderful movie oh it's one of the best and, i love it probably, so much probably no surprise to anybody either uh but this movie did win 1938's oscar for uh art direction yeah not no surprise there <laughs> okay it's good looking okay now, yeah, I just had a list of the awards it won. It won three Oscars, and Art Direction and Score were two of them. Now, before we get to our uh, uh, rating here and, of course, uh, our, our Stallone connection, before we do all that, we do have to uh, get to an email here from Brian, who may or may not have had anything to do with the uh, hanging Chad debate that we had going on in the show last week. Uh, and here's here's his email. It uh, reads as follows. Guys, I'm excited about the impending podcast, but Adam referred to the film as a Disney film. If you watch the Robin Hood and it's got the animated title role, you're watching the wrong movie. I think I was, if if I had said that, I, I apologize. I think I, at least my intention was to say that that was the one I was familiar with the most. So, uh, Robin Hood and it's I'm sorry I read that if you watch the film where the protagonist walks into a banquet hall with a stag and don't come out thinking it was the ballsiest movie movie cinema history (laughs) you have no soul (laughs) or maybe you've seen more movies than me yes the dialogue does get hokey at parts but the exchanges in this in that scene are brilliant many have mocked the name of the character Dickon in Game of Thrones but we have a Dickon here uh, Mythbusters asserts that it is impossible to split the arrow down another arrow because the arrow shaft wobbles a little bit, making such a shot possible. I really don't care. Because if you split an arrow, you really only tied the guy who shot first. And I don't believe that to be true at all. I, I think, uh, this is me talking, That I think that's a complete and utter misstatement. If you, if you split an arrow, not only did you hit that bullseye, you hit that bullseye on top of a bullseye. I think, you, I think you're double the... Uh, the uh, Bozeman is the other guy. Is that a word? Bozeman? Archer? Yeah, I think it's I think it's like, uh, you know, if you're uh, 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 playing shuffleboard and you knock the other little, whatever you call the thing, the other stone off of its spot, even though you both hit the same spot, you've just uh, flexed on the other guy. Yeah. Uh, this was when an era when actors seemed to take roles in film as a group. Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland, still alive at the time of this writing. Claude Rains, Basil Rathbone, and Alan Hale Sr. did a few movies together. I thought it was more, but at best I remember Errol Flynn uh, for this role in his pirate film, Captain Blood and the Seahawk. Uh, they are legendary actors who are better known for other roles that they've played, except for Hale, who was, I suppose, more of a character actor, best known uh, for siring Alan Hale Jr., who went on to play the skipper on Gilligan's Island. Errol Flynn was, as the young folks uh, today call, problematic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they would be right, and I leave it at that, but Errol Flynn was, to me, the greatest swashbuckler to have graced the silver screen. All three films I've mentioned uh, earlier are roughly all appear on the list of greatest swashbuckler films. Don't be afraid uh, to poo-poo on the movie either. I know you're not perfect. <laughs> that is uh, from Brian from Rockland, New York, and I think Brian may have had a little bit of something to do with while we're uh, discussing this movie today. Uh, before we get to our final review here and everything, we do have to ask ourselves one of the most important questions is how in the world this movie from 1938. This is going to be a trek. How does this movie relate back one-to-one with Sylvester Stallone? Why, thank you, Adam. I have a prepared statement. When I think of Sylvester Stallone, I think painter first, as we all do, I think. It goes painter, humanitarian, and then 80s action star. You know, as we all do. Now, dig, if you will, my joy when I found out that 
fine art superstar, Sylvester Stallone, has a painting of the star of this week's retro review, Errol Flynn. But you don't want to hear me drone on and on about the painting. Why don't I let the auteur speak for himself? Quote, early on in my life, I realized that man is totally pressed upon by the sense of time racing. Everything is timed. So I started to put clocks on my images, usually the ones of actors, Marilyn Monroe, W.C. Fields, Errol Flynn. Now, if you imagine their lives lasted 12 hours, I would paint them at 10, as opposed to what they would look like at four. At four, they'd be youthful, vibrant, optimistic. But when you move ahead to the 10th or 11th hour, reality has set in. Life is not everything you thought it was going to be. The colors have become darker. The eyes more sunken. End quote. Now, I know we work in an auditory medium, and describing this painting might take a thousand words, but allow me to try to describe it in 11. You can make out the clock, but how is that that Errol Flynn? (laughs) Look, I get that some people need to express themselves through art. All three of the row boys are these people. We make a podcast each week that is listened to by 11 people. It's called Clone Wars 30 Questions, and we still make it anyway because we have to. But you know what you'll never hear any one of us say ever? Uh, I think what we were trying to say with Clone Wars 30 Questions is that all fiction is a fantasy to make us forget about our eventual death. Each question takes us closer to the eventual finish line. And that is the difference between Adam, Bruce, Sweet, Shanzi, and Sylvester Stallone. Maybe the only difference. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's the only difference. (laughs) So there you have it, Dinglingers. This week's Stallone connection is Errol Flynn himself. And in celebration, let's do what Errol Flynn himself would do. Get really drunk, do a mountain of cocaine, and take liberties with young women who happen to have the misfortune of being around us. I'm Sweet Shonzi. You're welcome, Big Shoots. You're welcome. Sorry you worked at the snack bar. That's on you. (laughs) Ended up marrying that lady, by the way. His second wife. (laughs) Hey, but, you know, just because he had two others after doesn't mean that one didn't mean something, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, here at Here Movie Podcast, we have our own patented Robin rating system. If you'd like to check that out, head on over to Facebook.com slash Hero Movie Podcast. It's right there at the top of the screen. Bruce, where does The Adventures of Robin Hood from 1938 fall on the HMP scale for you? I love the character of Robin Hood, and I love Robin Hood movies. Like, I see every Robin Hood movie uh, without... Uh, even questioning it, no matter what the press is looking like for it. Like, like uh, obviously, I saw the Kevin Costner movie. People say it's not a good movie. Um, but at the time, people weren't necessarily thinking that. I mean, it, it did huge box office. That that was the summer of Robin Hood for me. I loved it. Um, I went out opening weekend and saw the Russell Crowe Robin Hood movie because Russell Crowe is one of my favorite actors. Robin Hood, he's playing Robin Hood. I couldn't pass that one up. I even saw the recent Taron Egerton Robin Hood movie opening night because it's just sort of a thing that I do. That movie's Um, great. I like that movie a lot. It's stupid and over the top, but oh my goodness, is it fun. And if they ever make a Green Arrow movie, they need to get uh, Taron Egerton to do it, in my opinion. But anyway, agreed. This is the Robin Hood movie. You know, I know the Douglas Fairbanks movie came first, but this is really the Robin Hood movie that did it because silent movies don't necessarily still have the cultural reach that maybe they once did. Um, this movie is kind of in special territory. Whether you like it or not, it's it's going to have something fun to see in it, and it's important. And I'm giving this that that rare rating that we don't use very often. I don't think I've given a movie a Carrie Kelly in three or four years. But I'm definitely giving this one a Carrie Kelly. Wow. All right. Sean, what do you got? Uh, for me, it's a, a low Damian Wayne. I mean, you know, it's it's a fun enough movie. Um, it, it, don't get me wrong. If you have problems with old movies, you're going to hate this movie. Yeah. But, uh, you know, sometimes for me, for me personally, sometimes, sometimes I find them super charming. And this happens to be one of those movies. You know, and there's something about Errol Flynn where you just want to watch him and you want to watch him be cool. And that is what this movie is. It's it's Errol Flynn being cool for two hours. So, you know, if that appeals to you, see the movie. Cool. 
Uh, it was interesting. I, I mentioned this in our text thread and everything, but I actually got this movie for free when Ultraviolet went out of business, <laughs> the where you would be able to download digital movies, and I had like a handful of uh, those Ultraviolet ones, and they were like, oh, well, we're going out of business. Here's a handful of movies on digital, most of them like, you know, quite old, including like Casablanca and King Kong and stuff like that, but this was one of them. And I, I just, I never really got around to watching it, so it's kind of sat there on the, uh, you know, the iTunes there, just looking at me going, hey, what's up? Anytime you want to watch me. And we finally got around to watching it. And I'm so sad that I didn't get around to watching this earlier. Uh, it does take about, it took about f- maybe five or 10 minutes for me to kind of get into it. But once we get into the hall there where he brings in the deer and flops it on the table in, in front of the invisible man and says, what's up, y'all? Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, that is, that's a good point, man. That is literally the moment where I was like, you know what? I'm in. Yeah. It, you, yep. you start to buy everything. You kind of, you, you wade into the story a little bit and it's like, oh, okay, I get all of this. And you're on a super fun ride through all of it. And, uh, Errol Flynn's just magnetic, man. You look at him, and you're right. He has a very kind of modern look for 1938, just modern day now. It's uh, it's really yeah. cool. It, the fight scenes, again, you're going to see stuff that, you know, is way better than that nowadays. But, you know, that's also what, you know, 70, 80 years of history will do to you. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's the limitations of the movie. It's what's going to happen. But, man, I can't believe how much of a great time I had with this. Uh, for me, this is a big Tim Drake. Good, nice, solid Tim Drake. I, I had a lot of fun, and I'll definitely be watching this uh, uh, in uh, you know a while. I mean, it, I, I mean, not next week or anything, but maybe in a year or so, I'll, I wouldn't mind popping this in and having a good time with it because uh, it certainly is that. It's a lot of fun. Cool action set pieces. The love story is fine. I'm glad that it's not too crazy and over the top, but it works for what it is. So, uh, yeah, Tim Drake for me. So check it out, everybody. That's uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood from 1938. Uh, good stuff there. Now, next week, We've decided to start doing something a little bit new, okay? We're going to be actually applying blame where blame is due. (laughs) And at the end of the year, we're going to see who picks the best films. We're going to tally them all up and everything. So next week, uh, next week's movie's being chose for us, or at least we're making him take credit or blame for it, is going to be Mr. Bruce Leslie. Bruce, what are we covering next week? John Carter, a movie I've never seen, but I've heard it's underrated, so I want to see it. So uh, with uh, Box Office Poison... Uh, what's his nose there? Uh, I can't think of his stupid yeah. name. The uh, uh, he's, it's like a yeah. Tyler something, Taylor something. Taylor Kitsch, that's it. Taylor Kitsch, thank you, Bruce. Taylor Kitsch, aka Box Office Poison. The guy's a good actor. Man, he really is. But man, man he is. Andy- yeah, exactly. It's like that. That was terrible, and uh, but he's just he's attached to a lot of movies that tank, despite him being a fairly decent actor. So we'll see whether or not you guys should have seen John Carter of Mars, uh, or just John Carter. They wouldn't put the of Mars on there when Disney or when whoever had it initially. They were like, people won't see it if it says on Mars in it. Well, people didn't see it no matter what. So uh, I don't know that that would have hurt it. <laughs> but we'll be talking about that one next week. In the meantime, Bruce, where can we find more of your work on the internet? Uh, just go check out Chubby Wizard, man. Still doing cool stuff on Chubby Wizard. And uh, I think I've got uh, some cool reviews you may not know about on Heroes and Villains, that podcast. Well, I've had some extra time. I put about seven new episodes up there so you can go listen to me talk about things like Tarzan and Zorro and uh, the Lone Ranger, some some more old school pulpy stuff. Very cool. Sean, what else? Well, we're about to shutter up the... Uh, the Clone Wars 30 Questions podcast. Uh, this week is the last episode of uh, Clone Wars ever. And if you have a subscription to Disney Plus and you are not watching the last four episodes of Clone Wars, you are doing yourself a massive, massive disservice. It is terrific. And we talk about it in the form of 30 questions, and it's Clone Wars 30 questions. The three of us are on there. Talking Star Wars. Guys, it it's so good. If it, even if you just watch these four things from this, just do that. You're gonna if you're a Star Wars fan, you are going to be wildly, wildly entertained from it. So it's uh, amazing. I mean, it, it honestly is amazing, these last four. Can't believe what they're doing over there. So uh we'll be wrapping all that up. And of course, check out the film find, uh dropping two about around about thirty minute episodes per week. Me and Matt have been uh kind of chopping up a storm over there, doing all kinds of things that you can find on streaming right now. So check that out. Uh, at the film find wherever you find finer podcasts that is it everybody thank you so much for making the past 
six years of this show fly by, and with any luck, the following yeah. years will fly by uh, as well. Again, thank you to all the supporters over at patreon.com slash HMP who keep this show going. And we'll see you guys next week when we're talking John Carter for Sweet Shawnsy from the Internet. Bruce Leslie, my name is Adam Portress, reminding you to stay super, everybody. Bye, Marty and Evie. All you have done is to wrap the